Thank you. <coughs> this is the November 19th Clinton School Committee. I'd like to start by approving the bills. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion being made and seconded. Any discussion? There being none, all those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. May we, can we have a motion to approve the minutes from the meeting of October 29th? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll there, second. Motion being made and seconded. Is there any discussion? There being none, all those in favor? Thank you. I'd like to have our student representative. How are you, Charles? Good evening. The FIRST Robotics program kicked off on the first of the month and has over 60 students signed up for the coming season. Last weekend, freshman Madison McDonald and sophomores Sophia Sanchez and Alyssa LeBlanc attended an all-day workshop at MIT for the Women in Aerospace Engineering program. They reported back that it was an amazing experience and will plan on bringing more of our female members next year. The robotics team is also kicking off the annual bridge building competition on Tuesday, November 27th at 6 o'clock. This event is used as a team building exercise for the upcoming season. The first students are divided into teams of five and paired with a mentor with a, bit, a mission to build a balsa wood bridge in one week. On Tuesday, December 4th, we will host a free pasta dinner for families of the first team and any other participants. Immediately after the dinner, we will break each bridge and therefore crown a winner for the bridge that holds the most weight. Along with the 12 first teams, we have the Hudson, the Hudson Cub Scouts returning, a team for, from Tejanto, a team from the middle school STEAM program, and I believe Dr. Meyer and his son will be returning, <laughs> and a team from Nipro Jabil. All are welcome to enter a team. They can pick up their kits, parts, uh, at November 27th at the meeting. <coughs> Clinton High School is in the midst of Spirit Week 2018. The Friday snowstorm has created a little disturbance in the week, yeah. but the, the high school had a 90% showing of the kids on a Friday with a two-hour delay and a cold rain. And they all came out decked in their best beach wear. <laughs> the four classes collected over 1,400 pairs of gloves and mittens and hats in a class challenge. Tomorrow ends the food drive, and the goal for this year is 6,500 pounds between the four classes. The community showing of the play Elf will take place in the high school auditorium on Friday, November 23rd, and Saturday, November 24th. Mia Houle will be representing Clinton High School at the Hobie Youth Leadership Conference at Bentley University in June. Congratulations. The annual Booster Club bonfire that was scheduled for this weekend, this Wednesday night, sorry, has been canceled due to the impending bad weather conditions. <coughs> this Saturday, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the Excel Club will be participating in Shop Local Saturday by wrapping gifts at Chaconi's on High Street. Donations are welcome at the table, and all proceeds will be donated to a charity determined by the members' votes. Thank you. Charles, before you go, um, did, did you have a question? I did, but you can go first. No, go ahead. Did, how many kids did you say were signed up first? 60. 60. Yep, 60. That, that's a lot more. Th how many did you have last year? Certainly. Like 30? Um, I'd say about 30 or so. Yeah. It's wow, a, that's impressive. Yeah, right. it's, it's definitely a, a larger that's amount. Yep. Yeah. We're looking to get more, too. And I think I need to correct the, um, the dates for ELF. Oh, yeah. I believe it's Friday, November 30th. November it's Saturday, day. December 1st. Yep. Yeah, right, correct. next yeah. Okay. I right. gave them the wrong dates. So I'll yeah. just to see if you guys are alert. <laughs> <laughs> so before you go, mm -hmm. uh, just on behalf of the entire committee, please uh, wish your classmates, and I know we have an athletic update coming up, but please wish them well in the Thanksgiving Day game. I certainly will. Thank you very much. Okay. Go get them, Gales. <laughs> Anything from the PTA tonight? Good evening. Hi, Kelly. Um, speaking of, of ELF, mm -hmm. the PTA will be um, having the play the weekend of November 30th and December 1st. We can't wait to see all the wonderful actors, and we would like to thank all the people that have helped come, ha helped this come to fruition. 
The uh, Clinton PTO will also be hosting a snowball dance at the elementary school December 7th. Um, it's coming together quite nicely. A parent um, will be our guest DJ for the night, and we've had a wonderful participation of parent volunteers. Um, we are also selling Per Vida bracelets for $7 each. Here's an example of it. Um, and you can see anyone on the board for a purchase. We also are doing a our 2018 gift card fundraiser, and um, I do have orders forms with me if anyone's interested. Mm -hmm. And um, we will be accepting orders through the 7th of December. And um, at, as of tomorrow, they'll be at all the schools in the offices, extra forms. And then our gingerbread shops will be coming in December to CMS and CES, and we look forward to providing the service for our families, and our next meeting it will be Thursday, December 13th at the elementary school library. December 13th? Yep. What time? 6.30 p.m. Okay. We had to adjust our um, meeting um, due to the holidays. We've been meeting the third Thursday of the month, and we had to adjust it, so. Okay. And then I have CPAC. CPAC, yep. So we are also participating in the Chaconi Family Fitness um, Shop Local this Saturday. <coughs> and we'll be selling um, Clinton Mass t-shirts, autism awareness pins, holiday ornaments. And um, we are we have also made some garland that's light, that you can light up that um, we'll be selling too. Cute. And um, we are also selling um, a greeting cards, a box of 30 for $30, and you can choose your box, um, thank you, blanks, all occasions, birthdays, and all money that we make at this event will go towards a guest speaker for the spring of 2019. And we had our translator at our meeting, um, at our last meeting, and it went very well. And we would like to thank Yvette from Adult Learning for donating her time and talent. It is very much appreciated, and um, we did use her during the meeting, so that was wonderful. And our next meeting will be held Tuesday, December 4th at 6.30 in the CS Library. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? I'll take them. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like them too. Oh. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Anything from the CTA this evening? Nothing this evening. Thank you. Is there any public comment? There being none. Mr. Superintendent. All right, so um, I think it'll be kind of a light agenda from for me today, but we'll start with our uh, fall athletic update. So I'll have uh, Karen and, and our athletic director, Mr. Smith, would like to come up. Obviously, we know we made some changes to the athletic department this year. We did the, uh, the elimination of user fees. Um, we also uh, tried to change the um, uh, athletic director position into more of a uh, like a full part-time position not just kind of an add-on stipend position um, so we wanted to kind of now that the fall season is basically over with the exception of one game figure we give a little update on how things are going um, I'm going to start uh, with just the figures and then I'm going to hand it over to John All right. so um, if you look at page two of the athletic report where I'm going to be be short and sweet because it's very early in the year. <laughs> um, the general fund uh, budget for athletics this year is 307,230. Expenditures through the end of October were 38,341. That's 12.5% of the total general fund athletic budget, leaving a balance of 268,888. Um, if I include the encumbrances that I've added in, which would um, include all of the transportation I have encumbered and just the fall coaches. Um, that would leave me with a balance of 138.92, and that would be 50% of the budget that's been expended. Uh, the revolving account, um, we started the year with 35,570. Uh, this year, as you know, we do not have any athletic fees. Um, the revenue that we've received thus far is 6,703. Uh, the football gate was 6,422, which was up 1,266 this year, which was pretty good. That's great. Uh, the donations were 281.25, and we're still awaiting the Thanksgiving game receipts. 
Um, the expenses were 930.52, leaving a balance right now in the revolving fund of 41,342.85. Um, so, but, but, with the, um, the admission charges, those are the same this year as they were last, right? Yes, so it means, they're the same. So it, it's mm -hmm. an increase in people coming there, right? It's, it's, I believe so. I, I, I would like to give kudos to John. He's been doing a fabulous job. I get the receipts so quickly, and um, he's doing a really great job. Might be shaking people down then. <laughs> <laughs> and so. hey, it's working. I don't care. <laughs> he is. Do, do, we get, do we get some of the... The, uh, do we get any of the proceeds uh, for the away game on Thanksgiving? But we usually, we uh, usually we, do. We, do, Are we, we usually have an agreement to split yeah. the gate on Thanksgiving. Oh, oh fantastic! Yeah. So okay. we should be getting a little bit more. Right. Hope for warm weather. It's not. We can hope for it. <laughs> we don't need to broadcast that only, to our wide viewing. We audience. don't charge for any other varsity games, just football. Uh, basketball. basketball we oh, we do. Oh, okay. Basketball. It All was right. just boys basketball, I think. Is that girls. no girls, girls too? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, just basketball, okay. and that's it. Um, so the majority of the games is in the football season when you get the most of the fees. Um, so that's all I had, unless anybody had any questions. Other questions for Karen. <laughs> So, generally speaking, we think the, the revolving account will have all the gate receipts go in and we'll be paying for the officials and any other supplies, or do we think we can maintain that? Well, thus far it looks like it. I mean, we did increase the budget this year because we knew we weren't going to have the fees this year. Mm -hmm. um, the increase in the athletic budget was um, 63000 about 63500 over last year. And that was because of this anticipation that we weren't going to have the fees. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as right now, I don't see any problems with it. Um, I've encumbered the majority, I've encumbered all the transportation, and that might even be a little more. I did, you know, I estimated what the transportation would be. Um, the only thing, the major thing that I uh, still have some supplies, but the supplies are as that's the money that you have, so you stop spending. And um, the only other thing is coaches, which I'll be encumbering the um, winter coaches very shortly, as soon as I get the list. So, so I, I think I think to answer yeah. the you know to answer the question, I think we didn't really budget using much of the uh, revolving fund yeah, at all revolving. because we knew we weren't going to have a huge revenue stream coming into it. Mm -hmm. I think this year, as we see how it goes, we're going to be able to to plan accordingly for next year. Um, and you know some some of the expenses that are in there, I believe, is like the soccer nets and stuff. I think there's some of the things that we things that just kind of we ha we weren't we didn't budget, but we had to repair them or we had to replace them, so we were able to use the revolving account for it. I did look at last year just to give an idea, and um, the expenditures are lower than they were at last year. So I mean, as far as I see right now, I don't see any problems at all. Okay, so, so collecting more and spending less. Spending less. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <It's doing good. laughs> and, and that said, do you, are, are, our, um, are our ticket prices in line with, you know, other schools, other events? Does that seem pretty consistent? Are we... I'm right. not sure. Um, I, not? I have asked at the athletic director's meetings um, what they charge, and it's pretty basic um, knowledge that's $5 adults, $3 students, and um, we've always, always let our senior citizens free here in Clinton, sure. so we, we never charge our senior citizens here, so we kept that policy going. The other thing, I, we normally would always use the general fund before we even hit the revolving fund. Sure. So, you know, after um, the next season, we'll have a better idea, but I don't really foresee any problems this far. Anything else? So, I know it's early, but did the um, the waiving of the fees? Well, I was gonna. Well, yeah. So John's got a little more of an update. Oh, specifically yeah. to that. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, great. Um, the the fall fees last year, just to give you an idea of what we got in last year at this time with the athletic fees, it was about eighteen thousand three fifty. For just the fall sports last year. Yeah. Which is the largest season. It's the oh, okay. largest season. Mm -hmm. So, but again, we did increase the budget. Because yeah. we knew we weren't going to have those things. Anyway, I'm, I'm, and I, to you, Steve, and, and Karen, and well, now Smitty, with the, I, I'm, I'm really happy that we were able to figure out a way to not charge for the sports, and it seems to be working. 
because if you know, and I know I looked at the numbers already when she set up, but just a couple kids that are playing, right. now you're getting more and more. It, it, anything we could do to you know, save people a couple bucks, and then the fact that we would able to squeeze it in there, I think it's great. And get more people to play. Yeah. Do we feel that we've gotten uh, a, a larger uh, participation because oh. of the no athletic um, fees? Or? Yeah, gonna, we're going to go right into that. We're going to yeah. go into that. I'm going to leave him to do all that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I, I know you guys have been interested in the participation numbers here now. Um, so just for the fall season, we're up to 166 CHS athletes. So we're about up to uh, about 15 more athletes than we were from last year. Um, CMS athletes are down seven athletes, but um, I mean, that number kind of fluctuates because so many kids do try out for um, Clinton Middle School, but we can't keep them all. All right, so maybe just in field hockey, um, I think is the only squad that was a, at full capacity. Um, but um, so we had 223 total athletes in the school. That's up four altogether. Um, the sports that was showing the most increase in participation was cheerleading. Cross country was up. Um, Football was slightly up. Boys soccer was extremely um, up, and CMS girls soccer showed a strength in numbers. Um, so just on the participation aspect of things, I think it's important to say that um, we were able to sustain our numbers this year because from interviewing um, our athletes and coaches, I felt um, a lot of a, a lot of the problem was that kids were leaving sports within the first two or three weeks because there was an opportunity for them to play without JV teams. And I think with the added JV teams that we added this year, our, our numbers sustained. So I don't think that's something that was shown, that can be shown on paper. And that's, that's definitely a comment that I, I wanted to make. And also from interviewing a lot of my athletes, I know that, you know, I coach girls basketball. I had three, I had three seniors that tried out for the cheerleading team this year. Um, and they cheered at the JV level just because they could, because they couldn't afford to play another sport in the past. So those are three varsity um, athletes in basketball. Um, they cheerleaded for the JV team because we had a JV cheerleading team and they had a great time. And, and honestly, uh, I went to a lot of cheerleading practices to check it out this year. And they work out extremely hard and oh, I think sure. it's going to benefit <laughs> those three basketball players because they did nothing in the fall to get ready last year and I made sure they do that so I think that's really going to show uh, a big turnaround in them um, and I, I think I saw that in a lot of um, a lot of sports this year there was kids that weren't afraid to try out because they weren't pressured into thinking I can't waste um, whatever it was a hundred dollars on a sport just to see if I could play and the fact that we didn't have any JV teams last year um, certainly made an effect. Um, so that's what I have for the participation aspect of things. Questions for Mr. Smith? Yeah, Schmitty, are we planning any time this year to do, um, like, or maybe you've already done it, it just hasn't, I haven't heard about it yet, but like like surveys with some of the parents and things like that to maybe even like an open house or something like something. It's your first year, it's a new position as AD for you just to get a feeling for at least what the perception is and maybe what some of the issues are that like some of the parents may have. Um, is anything like that like, you know. So, I mean, I've been a pretty much an open book when it comes to um, communication between parents. I think I'm very, I've been a very approachable that way. I know we had our um, athletic kickoff at the beginning of the school year and I made it known that I, w I would be available at any time for people to email me and I would, and I'd be a type of person to get back to them ASAP. Also, on our athletic website there is a section where um, parents can make some constructive criticism <laughs> Um, and, the, and those type of comments that would get back to me, there, were, there is also a survey on that page on um, <coughs> things like what, what type of new sports would they like to see come to Clinton High School if there was opportunity or availability. Um, so there is a survey section on our athletic website for those type of things. Okay. Other questions? I just had a question about um, uniforms and how, how we're doing with uniforms. Um, in years past, I feel like 
we find out the need for uniforms when we've needed uniforms, you know, new, new, new uniforms years ago, and it gets to the point where, um, you know, we would be getting parental complaints that we don't have. So I don't know if we've, I don't know where we stand. Do you have a system uniforms. in place for Well, um, I think, um, I've, I from, ta all right. yeah. <laughs> talking, from talking to Karen, we have discussed this subject yeah. before. Yeah, um, when we were doing the budget, and John and I are going to be doing <clears throat> going over the budget stuff um, when we get back from Thanksgiving, but we've made some notes on the budget papers um, on what teams got the, the um, new um, uniform. uniforms, uniforms. <laughs> and then um, what year they got, and so we've been trying to keep track of that so that it's not always the same teams getting the same uniforms and trying to get into a um, rotation. So we, we have made notes on them. So when we meet after Thanksgiving, um, we're going to review them again and see how he feels when okay. he looks through the inventory okay. and stuff. Okay. I think, you know, from from my perspective, stepping into it last year, I think that it's a good system they have, they have going now where they're trying to at least, um, in the budget process, accounting right. for uniforms every year and realizing that you know we're going to have to refresh cycles every year, right. and that's I think that's the way to make sure you sustain it. You know, if you have that five-year right. cycle or right. six-year cycle where everyone's getting new uniforms, um, you never have that thing where you know right. it, you don't do some giant fundraiser, buy them all new, and then in 20 years or 10 years everyone needs them new again or whatever. So like we've got notes like football got shirts in 2016, you know th things like that we've written down. Mm -hmm. So. Now when John and I sit down, we'll just go through what we did on the notes last year, and you know he'll give me new notes and what he thinks. So it works out well. The next year, you know what you talked about the year before. So I think it's a good system. Oh, right. yeah. right. Can I ask and you? I, go oh, ahead. Please. Oh, I just have one other comment. Um, there used to be a year-end sports banquet that was an open community event, and they we gave away, I think we still give away like the memorial scholarship, uh, memorial awards for athletes. I, I know like some of the athletes' families used to actually come and give the give the awards, and I've noticed in the last couple of years, I don't know if it just got too big and it can't be that public event anymore. Um, is that something that we think we might be able to do, or I, I think it was done either privately just for the senior class now, or? Um, so, uh, you know, I'm still investigating some of those uh, factors of why um, those things kind of lacked the last couple of years. So um, I have talked to the Booster Club about um, bringing back at least senior banquet this year and perhaps doing the memorial awards at that time um, as, you know, as I get my feet wet, we'll go bigger and stronger. I think um, as the following years, we'll probably go all sports banquet the following year. Um, I just want, for this year, I, just coming in, I really wanted to make sure that we're back on even keel. So, um, you know, if you followed my social media accounts right now, I, you know, I made sure that every kid has gotten, a, gotten their varsity letter that they deserved, gotten their varsity pins, anything that was backloaded that they haven't received before. You know, I, um, I've surveyed all the kids in school to see what, you know, um, what they needed and and I and I kind of and I wanted to make it a little bit of a personal note with them this year just because they know the meaning behind getting a varsity letter <laughs> instead of just yeah. having a banquet and just saying oh here you go you know and they so I we discussed a little bit about the history of how you earn your varsity C playing your first real varsity uh, season to earn your C and now you earn your pins there after mm -hmm. uh, and, um, so yes, I uh, would say yes. We're we're working on bringing back uh, the banquet. We are. Um, I did. I just had a discussion with that with the Booster Club about two weeks ago. Oh, okay. Tina, just to, uh, to answer your question, it did. It did get. It, it was just so big. First of all, we were, ended up doing it after seniors left. It, 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 it was a difficult time of the year. We mm -hmm. we did. We we would have uh, pizza or some or even a, a dinner <coughs> in the auditorium. In the, Mm -hmm. Calf, we'd have a a former Clinton High athlete come back speak. Would be a male athlete when you're a female athlete the next year. And but it did. It would get on so long because there were so many students. And then as of late, the last few years, yes, that's what's happened. During senior week, during rehearsals, they end up giving out some type of. Uh, jersey or Switch something church, like I that. But, something yeah, like John has that. spoken talked about doing something different. I know some schools have had two, 
because the number it's more manageable. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that in the past. Really, was able to do that one for fall sports, and then one for oh, spring. Okay. That, but mm -hmm. that's just that has come up in the past. But yeah, it's it just kind of went by the side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John has spoke about yeah, that. it's food for thought. So. Bringing it back. Uh, okay. so, how did you go? Uh, what were the numbers, the ballpark numbers you came up with for the lacrosse? Um, I probably should have given you a heads up before. <laughs> uh, it's okay. No, I, okay. All right. So, um, I did. I did take a, a week long survey at the high school for uh, lacrosse, and then I went down to the middle school, and I did it. I did a two two day survey for lacrosse. Um, so I. I believe, if I can remember, um, the boys' numbers were not very strong. Um, we had, um, off the top of my head, maybe 22 kids signed up from 7th through 12th grade. Um, and, uh, I mean, and actually no one from 7th grade actually signed up, you know. Um, so down the middle school, I had the teachers talk to the lunch tables to come up. I brought down a bulletin board. Um, the one, uh, the other, um, on the girls' side, I think we had about 34, 35 girls signed up on the girls' side from seventh to twelfth grade. Um, the only, the most concerning part being is that out of out of all those kids, um, probably probably five have actual lacrosse experience. Everybody else that I talked to had never played lacrosse before. They were just kind of showing you the trust or kind of coming up to hang out with me at my table um, <laughs> during lunch so they get out of the lunch room. Um, you know, uh, so I just, uh, it was just a low percentage of kids with inexperience that were, that were playing. So that was what I took down as a survey. Um, but we, going forward. you know, we do have programs though where kids will enter a freshman program or a club program or a middle school program where they haven't played a sport before, right? I mean, there is a, there's a coaching aspect to it, isn't there? Oh, I mean, sure thing. I just mean um, when we're talking about starting a new program, now I've, I brought this up that, you know, I've brought this up at the district meetings, at the athletic directors meetings, and they just kind of like told them, um, asking them, oh, so how would I proceed with this? And right. Um, you know, from what the from what the experienced athletic directors were telling me is, is that you need to have a set foundation of a youth league um, in your town to be able to be able to compete at a lacrosse level. Um, I mean, I certainly think we could maybe look at um, a club if you want to if you wanted to get a coach in here. Um, who maybe would know about lacrosse? I just, I just think like I was asked to start um, looking into a JV lacrosse program because you have to do two years of JV lacrosse to be able to apply to be a varsity lacrosse team, and the fact that you know, lacrosse isn't a very popular sport with in small communities. There's not a lot of small teams that have it. I know there's a lot of co-ops going around for Maynard, Bromfield, they're together, and so forth. But those teams play. Um, a very higher division schools when they're when they're playing their uh, games. So to think that you know, if you just throw um, inexperienced kids that don't even know the rules of lacrosse out there to play a JV schedule like that would be certainly a concern of mine. And having um, the fact that having a seventh grader play with a twelfth grader is a concerning factor. Um, if we you don't have any middle school team. kids playing with high school teams now. Well, you think when we split, you think we split, we split with JV varsity. So those, you know, like if you wave up, um, usually you wave up the most experienced athletic eighth graders to play, say, JV basketball for girls. So the three of them would play, you know, eighth, and typically they'd be playing against eighth, ninth, maybe tenth graders. Um, I mean, the concern would be is that to have a boys team like that, you're, you're telling me that we're going to take a middle school kid and, and an actual 12th grade playing on, on the same team, competing, you but, know, against them and but, set it out. I'm sorry, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying. Oh to no, that's you, fine, Joe. But, but you had said that we would have to start as a, a JV or a club type program if we were to have it. 
Right. And so I think that, you know, we might have the seniors, but very likely the other schools wouldn't. Is, is that right? Uh, yeah, I would guess you're right. So, okay. so you know, one of the questions that I had was that, you know, we've had four to five years, I think, without any participants um, in our middle school football program, which leads me, sorry, that's not true. So we have participants in the middle school football program, but they don't play for the middle school. They play for Clinton High School. Is that correct? Right, on the fresh, on the eighth and ninth grade team. Okay, so so that takes the place of a freshman team. Right. Okay. Do we still carry a stipend for the middle school football coach? Uh, I believe we do. Yes. Okay. Is is does the so does do not only the kids but the coaches get folded into the program? What do you mean? So so not only the athletes. The, so the athletes, the seventh and eighth grade athletes, for middle school football, play at the high school right. and and the the middle school coach i'm assuming coaches in the high school program as well yes he coaches uh so he'll take he'll take the eighth and ninth graders to the side and then they'll, they'll they'll run their plays on the so, side so it's only eighth graders that play uh seventh graders are eligible to play I, right so i just don't i think understand. we have one we have one seventh grader I, I just don't understand the inconsistency then if if we're looking at options that kids might be interested in and you know in your survey you've got 30 plus girls and I think you said 20 plus boys from seventh grade to 12th grade and it just it doesn't seem like there's an option for them to have this experience where it seems like it you know for other sports that we have middle schoolers can play at the high school level right so the only the only reason i i said what i said was it's just uh so those kids have gone through their youth sport aspect right where i when i did the survey only about five to seven percent of those kids have ever played lacrosse before where the rest of these kids have played youth football for five or five, four or five, six years. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so, the, I mean, so the safety factor of them not of going onto the field, they know the rules mm -hmm. and have been skilled and have, you know, I don't know the necessary skills, but they've, they have the necessary experience where you have, you know, whatever, 12, 15 kids that have played before to make a team. It's true. That's not not totally unheard of with JV sports. I mean, there's a, a lot of kids. I mean, it's not so much now, but in well, some field hockey is an example as well. Golf is certainly football an used to be like it's different now with youth football because they allow kids of all, you know, weight classes to play. But like when I was younger, like there a lot of kids. The first time they ever played football was their JV or like or, or freshman football. So I mean, they probably are more familiar with the rules of football just because they watch it as fans. So I. I I understand that aspect of it. Yeah. You know, they don't know the rules, but I think no matter when we, um, you know, if and when we decide to move forward, it's it's going to be a tough. <laughs> I think it's going to be a tough first couple of years, no matter what. Um, and I mean, we do. I, well, if you know, Schmidt knows the numbers that there's. It's only like you know seven percent of the kids. I I just always assume that I thought a lot of kids in Clinton played in. I thought Neshoba has a, a youth. Um, they do that. So the, um, you know, I, and I think I think the numbers probably bear that out. That there are less kids that um, the Clinton actually has more kids playing at at certain levels mm -hmm. in the the youth program, and and Clinton's always been a full fully founding member of Neshoba Youth Lacrosse since the beginning, but um, there are more kids uh, that play at, you know, the, the fifth, sixth grade level from Clinton than there are from, uh, I think, from Lancaster. Gotcha. Um, but, but that's, you know, they're a couple of years away. Yeah, so it's like, like, could be, so, they could be so like I'm catching not sure, up. You know, I, I'm not doubting your numbers oh, at no, all. No, yeah, no, at no, all. I um, and, I, and I think that, that Ed makes a great point that, you know, there, there's a learning curve. Um, my experience has been that, um, you know, at uh, at 
at high schools where it's an established program, it's oftentimes a first uh, first foray into the sport. Um, uh, that, that's true for Neshoba, where, where the lacrosse program for years has been, uh, you know, sort of, in some cases, not for all, but in some cases, a sort of a second sport, and just athletes gravitate toward it and figure it out. But um, I, I'm not second-guessing anything you're doing, and I appreciate all of the work that you've put into <coughs> looking at options for our Clinton High School student-athletes. May I ask you one thing? First of all, I'm sorry for opening the door on the cross. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Brittany. I asked no, her to do it. Andrew get the bus. But then, <laughs> no, and I don't want to know the town because I don't want to put any, any, you know, any conversation you had you know, kind of like off the record or whatever, but is there a possibility of a, like you said, Maynard and someone else has a... a right. Again. So, I mean, you know, there's, there's two students in our high school that have actually played the sport, female and male, and, and have gone up through fifth grade and up and I've been trying very hard to trying to find a program for them to play in because even if we did start a club lacrosse that, that would be a disservice to those two athletes who have the experience to probably play um, on a team um, so I brought it up at the the past every uh, district AD meeting we've had and unfortunately um, I get crickets every time I go. Nobody's looking into um, um, co-oping in the lacrosse program. I've asked every I've asked every school at those meetings I have, um, and they're just um, either the numbers are strong enough where the MIA wouldn't allow them to co-op a team, um, or I mean, there's some. Um, disinterest because um, even if a team was even on a borderline level, um, if they again the rules state that if you just took one of our players, you have to add their school enrollment to their school enrollment, and that would knock them up two oh. divisions gotcha. um, in their playoff system, and that would that would send like you know if like if we co-op with Bromfield, then you're looking at Bromfield playing. Bedfield in the playoffs because they're now holding three to four schools. Um, so we're gonna have to co-op with a really big high school so that our numbers like don't really. Right. Affect um, <laughs> so so right now I mean there there is I mean I'm holding we'll out I'm holding out year. a little bit um, of hope that um, I know Tahanta is currently thinking about starting their own lacrosse program but they are getting. Um, that, that's been a three, they, uh, we had Pete Mackey in for a meeting at um, the superintendent's office to talk about this, and he said this has been probably a three or four year plan for their Boylston system, who, is, who has raised the money to um, start the program for Tahanto. So it's, they would be co-oping with Boylston? West Boylston? Or? Well, the, their kids, their Boylston kids play in the youth program right. there, right? But, but um, not with West Boylston. But, uh, well, West Boylston kids play there. Right now, P. Mackey said their, their sign-up numbers were up in the 70s um, at Tahanto, so they didn't really know sure. um, which um, avenue that they're going to pursue. Um, they, the, um, I know that he, they kind of mentioned that if, the, if they can be a standalone program because they're um, feeder system is paying for the equipment, the nets, and and they're um, and they're not having lacrosse on their grounds. I'm not sure where where they play, but they said they because um, it would ruin their grass fields. They're gonna have them play at their lacrosse. I don't know wherever they play lacrosse. The Hunter feeder system plays lacrosse, and they were gonna bust. They were gonna bust them there after school um, so he says that I mean he says he doesn't know if that's going to go in fruit uh, if he doesn't know if that's the avenue they're going to go but he said if there's opportunity um, I don't know if they would look, look to West Boylston first because Boylston and them already have a um, connection with the youth league and their football team so I don't know if they would go to them first um, when I asked the district meeting about the try you can't try up unless um, they need a third party in, so you can't just go in and say, why don't us three go in at the same time? They have to see what the numbers are with who they choose first before you bring in a third 
school. So when I asked that question at the district meeting, or I asked Pete Mackey. Any other interest in, that kids have in other sports that we're looking at? Or? Um, I mean, um, I, I have been briefly asked about, you know, if I ever look into bringing back volleyball. Um, that seems to be um, one sport that I would perhaps take my next survey on. Um, also, winter track is probably a, a future sport that we're going to look into, too. Good. It'd be interesting to know how many Clinton kids are in that the Neshoba Lacrosse League from what grades are they, fifth, sixth? It's uh, third through third eighth. Through. That, I mean, that would be, because that's like I don't think they're the future. Be, I think it's primarily third through eighth. So if it's a case now, we're just like the kids seven through 12, they didn't have those youth leagues back when they were younger or they just didn't play in them for whatever reason. But if we do have a lot of kids in like that third through sixth grade, uh, if they're in that Neshoba youth league right now, you know, it's a, it's a good idea to see what we can do now if we're going to have a first couple tough years with JV or club or whatever, yeah. you know, the goal would be to kind of, you kind of maybe want to get through those, those learning curves, get through those growing pains now. So that when that group in the younger grades is now of like seven through uh, 12, you know, they're ready to play. They'll have a system that will at least be, you know, the foundation will at least, will at least be there for them. Well, and I, I think, so you said we had close to 40 Girls, is it? Can you run a girls sport without running a boys sport? It wasn't. It wasn't 30. forty. It was I think 30. it was thirty. But yeah, thirty-four. So. Um, we can. We have to be. We have to be plus or minus one, uh, usually for uh, Title Nine compliance. So normally, we would yeah, be able just, to run. I think it's a shame. Know, we could start if, one without the other. You know, if if there's a legitimate interest, um, you know, if we can't do something, I, I don't know what the solution is. That's 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 in your lane. I don't want to be in your lane. You know, one thing we've kind of talked about is um, almost seeing if we could either, uh, I don't know if it's a position we'd almost have to create maybe with the, with the union and come up with a little kind of stipend and title for it or something like that. But I think, um, I think one of the, one of the uh, obstacles I think that we're running into maybe right now is that um, I think for someone to, for us to kind of get a program going, we need to, I think one of the things you're going to need to find is like a coach or someone that's going to be that like champion for the program. Um, so I don't know if there's something like even as simple, even if we started this simple this year as a, you know, a, a small club season or a, or even a skills camp over April vacation or a summer enrichment program. For, but if we can get something where there's sort of someone kind of, starting to get lined up a little bit who might want to yeah. like build a program um, I think that would be a step to actually getting this from just us talking about it to it happening because mm -hmm. um, I think the problem is um, it's just not right now I don't think we have that person on staff who has that like knowledge and passion of lacrosse that's able to just step up and just say yeah give me that you know let's do it um, and it's just because it's a you know, I think it's a relatively newer mainstream sport in terms of what maybe some of our experiences were growing up. So, um, so I think that that might be something to consider as we move to the spring. Is looking at can we, could we, is there someone out there basically that wants to? Uh, you know, we had three three soccer coaching positions this year we needed to fill, and we ended up doing it by having two people coach three positions, fill three positions because we couldn't get anyone to apply for a third soccer position. So, I mean, the idea of finding a coach is actually, uh, it's not the, it's, you know, I know sometimes people think there's a line of coaches out right. there, but sometimes yeah. it's, yeah. you know, well, it's <laughs> on school hours too. So. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it sounds like from what you're saying, like the, the coaching is actually probably a bigger issue, like reason for hesitation or pause than the numbers of, of the students like the, the coaching is probably the bigger obstacle the bigger hurdle yeah well I mean I I don't know if it's a bigger hurdle we'd have to see what it would be like I don't know I mean if we did a posting for it maybe we would get five people that were interested or something okay. like that we'd have to see um, but what I think is you can't have if you're gonna have a team that's got mostly inexperienced people on it we're gonna have to have a coach who is 
kind of skilled in the fundamentals and knows how to actually teach them the game. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and right now, um, you know, I don't, I don't it's know. It's probably we, true all the time. I mean, <laughs> we always want to coach. Imagine that's true for all those sports. Yeah, right. right. They can teach them the rules of the game. But I see, I, I see your point. The, my, my point is, if I'm trying to find a, a baseball coach, yeah, I can probably walk around and half our staff members have played baseball or softball at some point in their sure. life. So if we were scrambling for a coach, we're going to be able to find someone who can at least right. put something together resembling a team. Sure. Um, where I don't think we have. Um, that necessarily that experience with mm -hmm. lacrosse and i mm -hmm. think that that's just that's one of the things of just that's that's where i view i think if we're if if this is going to come to fruition i think what we need to start at some point is we need to try to get someone to kind of be the knowledge expert and the champion of it um from that standpoint so we can start really looking at things like you know 30 30 kids express interest you know three kids own their own equipment four kids have played before what can we do with this mm -hmm. you know what i mean because i don't i don't know you know right um you know yeah like did i coach freshman programs and football here with kids that had never played baseball before really and never played football before yeah but there was like two of them and they, they alternated in right field while the rest of the team could could catch and throw a ball you know what i mean so it's tough to say i, I couldn't start a team i couldn't play a team with with seven of those kids or it'd be very hard you know so um so it's a you know i think it's a it's a balancing act because i think you want to make sure one as we move forward we want to make sure it's successful too right we don't want to invest in equipment we don't want to invest in goals we don't want to invest in all the stuff and then we go out and it's just a miserable experience for kids because they're just getting beat up on and next thing you know no one wants to do so it. i agree with everything you said but I, I guess we'll never know we won't know the answer to that unless we post for the position if Right. So I, I, what I'm almost thinking is, is if we could maybe try to post for some sort of position about whether we call it like a club team, an intramural yeah. team, a skills camp, or some co combination of all three. Right. Where he knows what he's getting himself into. He's yeah. Like, and, <laughs> or and so yeah. we could try to come up with sort of a stipend for that amount. And it's really to kind of see like, okay, there was 30 numbers on 30 names on a piece of paper. Right. Now we're offering this thing. Of those 30, how many people went from name to here? And then how many of them, you know, if we can get to borrow some equipment, do whatever to get them to get through the first couple of weeks or something, and how many of them say, hey, this is great, yeah, I want to go buy my own equipment, I want to do that kind of stuff. So I think some sort of, like, exploratory kind of phase like that where maybe it's more of a, like I said, a shorter club season, sure. something like that. I mean, we're not charging for it, so, right. you know, it, you come out and it's free and it'll cost us a, you know, I think if we can come up with sort of a stipend that's, fair you know something commensurate to maybe a partial season or something mm -hmm. like that and try to post and, and the idea is when we post it we could say we're, we're looking for someone to gauge the interest and see going forward can you build a program sure yeah. okay so uh, that might be something to to look into at least and that way we're not we can we can see how it goes I just want to know because you had mentioned volleyball because the first year I was here we had volleyball mm -hmm. and then they dropped it and for FY14, we had 24 kids, and FY15, we had 25 volleyball players. So if you said you were going to do a survey for volleyball. We did have it, but it mm -hmm. got dropped like, what, four years, four years ago? Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Mr. Smith? I just, I, d I don't want you to leave without us saying how yeah, grateful we are that you're in the position. What a great job you're doing. Yeah, so you're doing please, great job. Uh, please know uh, how appreciative we are of all of your efforts. But I'm still not on Twitter, Smitty. I'm still not on Twitter, all right? <laughs> no, uh, I know, I hear he is. Yeah, yeah. Yes, he is. I figured out Facebook. I think I'm maxed out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a school committee tutorial for you. <laughs> but I do see his updates on Facebook. It's oh, um, I don't know. So we got, we just got some updates on. Right. Oh, sorry, please, yeah. Right. Um, I'll just read through them quickly. Uh, so just um, so just on some athletic news, and I, um, we just came down with some name points that we added JV teams for both CHS boys soccer and CHS field hockey this year. Um, cheerleading also had both. Varsity and JV. Um, we were able to replace the varsity soccer nets this year to replace the old broken down nets that are at the middle school. 
Um, so we took the old varsity nets and moved them to the middle school so they had a place to practice because I guess that was a big thing from last year. The golf team made the districts and um, Ryan Marshall was voted MVP of the Midland League. Um, I thought the girls soccer numbers, um, eighth grade numbers, um, were very strong this year which will probably be able to support a JV team for girls soccer. Um, field hockey did an extremely great job in their uh, community service effort. Um, they also won the sportsmanship award for uh, field hockey in their league. Um, you know, um, Mr. Hastings put together a great idea that we ran with, with the football chair and band going um, for a successful athletic fall, the Gales rally down to the Clinton Elementary School. Um, it was a great day where CMS in the um, Came to, CHS came to see us to connect with the younger students and they played with them at lunch and recess and um, they had some good Rappaport down there. Um, cheering also finished second in the league cheer competition and they qualified for district. Um, all our fall sports teams um, took part of cancer awareness nights. All right, boys soccer had a great, great night um, which was in which was for brain, uh, brain cancer in the memory of Eli Burke's father. Eli Burke is our current captain here at CHS Soccer. Girls Soccer ran Purple Night, which was an awareness for pancreatic cancer. And that was um, in memory of former soccer captain Angela Pallotta's grandfather who recently passed away. Um, football cheer and band um, had pink night to raise awareness for breast cancer. And field hockey had a very successful orange night which was awareness for in honor of CES student Kaylee Gilroy, who was in full remission. Um, and, and the field hockey team actually raised $1,450 to donate in um, Kaylee's name to Alex's lemonade stand. Um, we also sent four underclassmen to the Sportsmanship Summit last week at Gillette Stadium. And then um, I think we just wanted to add our communication improvements. I think um, the new athletic website seems like I'm getting a lot of good positive feedback on that. Um, online registration seems like it, uh, it's a success. Um, everybody seems to enjoy the social media accounts on Facebook and Twitter. And the team scheduler site, um, people are um, I've received a lot of comments about that, especially with it connected to the Notify Me app where um, parents can be personally notified on their phones when there is a schedule change um, ASAP. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Con much continued success. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, the... So the next uh, update was on uh, the academic achievement, and this is just uh, just going to kind of walk through it and give some minor updates. We'll be digging into some of this stuff as we get into budget season and those types of things. But um, you know, this is one of those uh, topics from the strategic plan that we want to constantly kind of be revisiting, so that we're making sure that it's more of a living plan and we're kind of uh, following that up. So our strategic goal: we want to develop and implement best practices for instruction to support all learners. Um, if you look at that outcome, they want a shared collection of best, pra best practices. So one of the things we have started is an instructional handbook. It's a Google Doc. Um, it's still a, a work in progress, but we have linked a lot of things, particularly things from our professional development. So the idea is whether it was professional development that happened this year or professional development we did last year, um, we're putting stuff in this one uh, document so that you can have it as a reference. So if you have a question about, you know, what should you be doing for a learning objective, you can go there and find a resource on it, an article on it, those types of things, um, expectations. So we'll continue to update that as we go through the year with our professional development. We'd like to we'd like to build some more things into it as we work on this document over the summer. We want to keep it more of like a living, breathing document because I think sometimes um, what I found is, you know, different initiatives come in at different times and different things are implemented, um, and sometimes you know people aren't sure what's what's still the expectation or what's the new expectation. So the idea is this document would be something you can refer to, and what you should find there should be the expectation. Um, aligning and enhancing the curriculum with the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. Uh, we've done uh, extensive work on that at the elementary school in terms of getting curriculum maps uh, in place. 
Uh, there's been a lot of work. I think those teachers are working uh, incredibly hard uh, implementing um, some of the new resources we use, some of the new Eureka math resources, some of the new writing uh, kits we've been using, and just really taking steps and making our, our instruction more um, standards driven and focusing on making sure that we're addressing the, the curriculum frameworks, not simply kind of following a, a book. Um, and it, there, is a, there is a difference. Um, you know, you need to, we really need to look at what those standards are, what the depth of those standards are. And there are, there are books or programs that might say they cover everything, but really if you drill down, um, you know, you need to go much deeper to truly work towards mastery of a standard. Um, the WIN, I think we heard a little bit of the Tri-Council meeting, we're doing some more stuff with the WIN in terms of getting our intervention blocks and our enrichment, at, particularly at elementary school, um, as well as in, even in the, in the middle school, um, for sixth, fifth and sixth grade, the middle school right now, they have a kind of a drama enrichment that'll turn into the Project Lead the Way kind of enrichment opportunity. And at the eighth grade, they're able to take some advanced courses like the Project Lead the Way or the full year of Spanish um, as enrichment opportunities. Um, some of the stuff they're doing during that wind block is, is really neat, especially down at the um, elementary school. I'll, I'll see the emails where they do the, you know, the, the kids doing like the video announcements yeah. for the day and that kind of stuff. And it's just, you know, it's nice to, nice to see them getting some time to do some of those other things and connect it to the technology and those types of things. Um, growth on standardized tests is kind of the, the last one we really had in there. Um, the, uh, oh, sorry, I guess Perkins plan is in the original one there. Um, so the Perkins plan, that's our vocational uh, programs. The, what's nice is um, uh, we have our tiered focus monitoring this year, formerly the coordinated program review. Because we wrote a Perkins plan last year, received Perkins funds, and claimed Perkins students, now the, the career and technical par portion is part of that tiered focus monitoring. However, they understand, you know, they've worked, I've, I've, the state has been working well with us, I feel, and been very supportive. They understand we're kind of new at getting back into this, so their review isn't actually going to be a critical review. It's what they're calling a technical assistance visit, um, so they can try to help us kind of map out what we need to do to be successful in the future. So that's, uh, you know, that'll be on December 10th. And then uh, growth on standardized tests, I think, you know, for right now, um, you know, we've been, one of our last PD days right before the Tri-Council meeting, we looked at delving deeper into that uh, MCAS data. Um, and I just think overall, I think that's our, our um, you know, our goal. You know, I know that's where to demonstrate student growth on standardized tests, but I also feel that, uh, you know, I feel like that's not necessarily a goal. That's sort of the result of, of us doing, uh, I mean, that's our goal, but it's not really, it's a product itself, right? It's an end result of if we're, if we're focusing on the standards and we're engaging all our learners, then that should kind of take care of itself. Um, and then increased enrollment in advanced coursework. So I know that's one of the other things we have on the docket. Our next curriculum instruction meeting is on December 5th. And I know at that point we'll be talking about some tweaks to program studies and, and changes at different levels. And one of those looks at making sure, you know, we are looking at our prerequisites and those types of things to make sure we're ensuring access to those types of courses to hopefully, um, you know, encourage students to uh, challenge themselves and enroll in those courses. So. Um, so that's a quick overview, I know that's very quick, but I just, you know, and the intent here is not to give, my intent was not to give a real, real detailed report if there's anything further you, you want us to drill down on, but I think a lot of these things will come up individually as we start getting into budget season and looking on other things, or they come up more specifically in other subcommittees, like the curriculum instruction subcommittee. And, and all of our goals in the strategic improvement plan are important, but this is the meat of, and the heart, yeah. the heart of, you know, what we do so or, yeah. or at least what you and your team are doing in right. terms of providing opportunities for students to be challenged to to um, to achieve and uh, so uh, I think we're and it is like it, you know this one in particular like I said it's it's um, this is like every day right. you know so it's not I understand like the different the different ones you know sometimes Technology can get stuck on a shelf, and unless you pull it out and look at it, you you forget what that goal was and what we're talking. Academic achievement, I think, you know, that's really what we're trying to do, you know, every day right now. And we're still, and there's a lot of changes that have been taking place, and a lot of things we're still trying to do. We're still trying to make sure we get uh, Read 180 and Systems 44 interventions run with fidelity. We had, I think, the coaching district again today. Um, we're trying to get the um, Do the Math Now intervention up and running. 
Um, I've attended a couple middle school department meetings, grade level meetings in terms of, you know, finding that balance of, of how do we continue to, to teach the grade level standards and where do we find the time and support to backfill maybe some gaps that existed and understanding how we need, it's important to do both those things simultaneously. Like we can't, we can't ignore the grade level standards just to backfill or we're creating a bigger gap. Um, but at some point, you can't just keep moving forward unless you're starting to get some of those foundational skills. So, trying to navigate those waters as we as we try to, uh, you know, make sure all our students are are learning and prepared. Thank you for the update. Any questions for Dr. Meyer on the, the academic achievement goals? Okay. Uh, the last thing I did was old fire station community forums. I don't think there's anything in your packet for it, but that's we had uh, three community sessions on. Uh, Veterans Day on November 12th, day after the yeah. the day off for Veterans yeah. Day, I guess November 12th. Um, we had a session at 7 a.m., a session at uh, noon, a session at 6 p.m. Um, you know, they weren't uh, highly attended. I mean, they weren't. Uh, it wasn't you know a room full of people, but we had people come to each session, and and I think each you know it was interesting to see um, what stakeholders came and what people um, what different people's views were. So the architect firm really kind of uh, facilitated the conversation. They were taking their notes. Um, the first couple sessions, we actually did tour, little kind of half tours of the fire station so the community members could see. Um, by the third one, it was a little kind of dark outside. I forgot it gets dark at like four now. So, <laughs> um, so the, uh, but overall, I think it was a positive night and I think we gave an opportunity for everyone to come uh, be heard. There is another session that will be held on December 5th here uh, we're kind of like we did the workforce breakfast last year. It's going to be a workforce type breakfast again, um, but it's being actually um, mass hire, which is formerly I think they're formerly the workforce investment board. Um, they actually attended the workforce breakfast last year, and they they wanted to um, to host. They're one of the partners in this urban agenda grant that we got, so they wanted to, to host a similar event here this year. So uh, that should be on December fifth in the morning. Um, and that'll be more targeted to specific invitations to, to business members to try to reach out and see who we can get here. Um, and it will also go to support the fire station project. So the next step for the fire station project is the architect firm is gathering this information. They're gather, gathering their measurements. They're working on different things. Um, they've got different, you know, uh, people looking at different um, parts of that building in terms of, you know, what's the cost for the bring it up to fire safety code, what's it cost to get the right bathrooms in place, what's it cost for the ADA accessibility. Um, so they're going to try to bring all those things together. So we should have um, like our deliverable, our, our feasibility study, um, probably in mid-January. I think January 15th, 17th, somewhere around there was the, was the, the deadline. Um, so that is, uh, that's the goal. That's when we should hopefully have some kind of preliminary vision of you know what we've as we've talked about this what does this kind of look like and some more sense on what would this project cost so i know we are asking for at least two specific two different numbers um one number would be basically what's the cost to like bring the building Get it up to code up to code yeah. and make it just a usable building and then what's the co what's the cost to do to outfit it to outfit it for the to the STEM center, yeah. Great. Makerspace. Thank you. Any questions on, on that update? And that it, it coincides with, remember, and I don't, you have probably have the date for it, but remember Phil Duffy needed it by a certain point to, was it the middle of January? Did that meet that? Yeah, that's with Phil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was for the grant. We yeah. have, that's why it's right. in the in the stipulation. They have to have it to us by like the middle of okay. January because I think as part of the grant, we have to get it to them by February 1st right. or yeah, something like that. Right. Yeah. I remember the dates for yep. All right, so, so I think uh, I think that kind of wraps up my portion. Okay, so uh, Dr. Meyer and I had the opportunity to attend the MASC MASS conference, um, and uh, it, it's uh, I think it's always a great opportunity to um, network with other school committee members, other superintendents, and and get a sense of the issues that other schools, other school districts are are uh, struggling with, and and. I guess the the good bad news is that we're 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 very much all in the same boat, and I think that there are a lot of uh, you know it's validating in a, in a number of ways um, when I think about the work that is 
uh, underway in the Clinton Public Schools and the, the effort that you and your team and the teachers are leading uh, along the lines that end up being recurring themes for this kind of a conference. And, and I, I know that we tried to attend um, you know, sessions in some of the areas that we talk about frequently in these meetings around safety and around uh, social emotional aspects of, of student learning and, and school culture and uh, building uh, projects and, and student achievement. And I, I, we, I was got, we got the branding and marketing in for Ed. Oh, we went to thank that you. one. Yes, so. branding and marketing <laughs> as well. It's, uh, but there's a whole bunch of work for you to do now. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, it was a terrific opportunity, and, and I was able to take a lot away from that conference, uh, both in terms of uh, my own uh, personal learning for our work together, but also, I think, in just in terms of that, that validation that, that we're doing some really good things here in the Clinton Public Schools. I didn't know if you wanted to weigh in on that. Yeah, I think it's. I think going to these conferences, like I said, it's important. Um, I think it is validating because I think there's a lot of things that we hear that we feel like you know it reassures you and reaffirms that you think we're on the right track. We're making positive uh, change here. I think, and and but it's also um, it's also a great learning experience because you learn that you know the people are presenting because they're usually doing it pretty well, and you realize that there's some other steps that you can continue to take to improve, and you start identifying maybe what are those next steps that we need to do. So it's, I think it's validating that I think we're on the right path. I think it's also uh, a reminder that we can always get better. Right, right. So moving on, we had uh, in our last session, we had uh, voted to approve a first reading of uh, policy EFD. Um, asked everyone to go back and take a look at that. You have a copy of the first reading in front of you, and uh, I would like to seek a motion to approve uh, as a second reading uh, policy EFD, uh, second reading and adoption. Uh, have that motion seconded, and then we can discuss it. I'll make the motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you. Yeah, now, discussion, if any. Well, first. For, and I did see it, um, and be, it was a question the last time, I think it was Tina that brought it up, where it had the school committee responsible for, that's been changed, right? Yeah, it was, it was right here, right? But it just says the Clinton Right, Public but schools. initially it had yeah, said it something with the school committee, and I think yeah. it was, yeah. uh, but, um, <clears throat> I don't know, wait, go ahead. You know. nope, go ahead. So I'm trying to find well, out what it was. No, I mean, I, so I read ours, oh, I, read the, the I read the MSCA proposal, I read the... Then there was like that Massachusetts law reform that, you know, they did that first study. And I think it's all very well intentioned, but I just fundamentally disagree. I, the, the, when I read this, to me, it just seems like it means free lunch. And the thing I'm worried about is that, like we talked about this last year, a year before, it was we don't want to get into the business of being bill collectors. We don't want to be chasing down. Like what we wanted to try to do was come up with a policy that would try to nip this problem in the bud before it got so large where we're now sending out letters and making phone calls. And my, my concern is that this policy just all it really says is if students are behind, they continue to get lunch and it just the their account or their name just gets forwarded to the to the business uh, department to Karen, and I just don't see how that I don't know I just don't see how that really helps us. I mean we're still the balance was originally it was around like twenty five thousand when we started talking about this right, and we put in these updates to the policy. It's still around like ten thousand. 8,000? Exactly, but it's gone down substantially. It's gone down substantially. But it's gone down, I think, because of that approach that we took. And I'm just nervous if we adopt this policy that that issue is just going to come back again and that account is just going to build up and then we're going to be back in the position where, you know, where where we don't want to be is, is, is bill collectors. And I'd be more willing to look at instead of just like throwing our existing one out and trying to adopt this new one, I'd be more prone to 
revisiting our existing one and seeing if there's things, you know, maybe there are some things we can change in there, maybe, because right now I believe it reads like no charge, you know, we don't allow students to charge for grades six, seven, and eight. So, you know, maybe we could, you know, uh, some sort of a grace period before we get to that point, or maybe there's some sort of a compromise, or maybe there's things we can do. I know a big thing in that report is they, they talk about uh, meal shaming. Maybe there's approaches we can take that, are, you know, are not so, um, you know, that are easier on the student, because I understand it's not the student's fault, but at some point, like, we need to have some, you know, we have to have some way to react to, to that issue, and I'm, I just feel like this policy, the way it's proposed right now, the way it's written, the recommendation from the Massachusetts School Committee Association, I just think that adopting that policy is gonna lead us right back into the, the issues that we had before, and, you know, it got brought to us last year to try to, to solve. Sure. So I, I do wanna point out that the, the previous policy that we had adopted was not just policy, but procedure, and, and that, you know, doesn't really fall under our purview. I, I think that, you know, when we're looking at a, a pol first of all, a policy that, that falls within Massachusetts general law, um, it, I think we have to be careful about what we're, we're putting in place in terms of the, the carrot and the stick options. Um, if it, and I, and I don't, and I want to be clear, I don't believe that's our, in our purview anyway. I think that, that the, um, the, the collection piece falls to administration. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, where, what we, what our, uh, responsibility to do is to, uh, ensure that we have, you know, take into account the fiduciary responsibility that we have to the school district, to the, to the citizens, uh, but also to the students and, and, um, the fact that, that, you know, we have to have uh, parents and guardians responsible for meal payments and not, you know, sort of pass that down to uh, students only. And, and I don't know how you get around the, the collection piece in that regard without it. Can I just say something, Joe? Because my opinion is part of the reason that the collection were improved was because the communication was improved. There was not a lot of that communication going on prior to that. And the other thing is, what I've been finding, because I've heard from different people, is like now that they have the online payment, I'm not so sure. I think that in communication needs to be improved even greater because those online, the online service that we have will send email to the parents so that they're getting an email direct that they, their balance is. And I'm not sure that all the parents are aware of those kind of things. So maybe, you know, Right, so in a sense we were following up on. So they, I think it was the greater the, the improvement. In I'm the sure that's a, I'm sure that's a reason, but I, don't, I would still argue the biggest reason right. was probably that we weren't allowing negative balances to charge anymore. There was, right. a, there was an incentive, now that you, when you, and I wasn't here, but when you, when you, uh, when you enacted this old, the, the, the policy that's currently in place, it gave the, the food services department the, 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 the teeth to enforce it, and it gave the parents the incentive to, to pay. Right. I mean, again, I hear, I was just saying, there may have been, like Ed said, it may have been one part, but this seemed to be working. I don't understand, and I mean, I've read this bulletin, but I don't know why, if, if this one's working, why there's a need to, and I'm not looking at you, Karen, I'm just looking out in general. No, <laughs> um, why is there a need to, to change a policy if the one that's in place is working? Well, the policy we have now can't stay the way it is. Well, and, and to end right. the policy right now is well, not yeah, like a valid you guys, policy. You said that, like, like, you said that at the last yeah, meeting. Right. I still don't. I cannot why? hold educational records. That's right. illegal. That's, that? no. That's illegal. I can't oh, hold yeah, educational yeah, yeah. records. All right. So, and I can't deny charge. I can't deny you a meal anymore. But you can still. I thought the, what we agreed to last time was was an alternative meal. Right. That's what. I, that's what. When, that's going to fall under Dave the same there. like food shaming thing. I mean, that's going to fall under that whole. Yeah, but that's just. I mean, that's a word. I mean, that's what that's what this group claims is going on. Okay, I mean, that's their opinion. That that's 
my opinion is we have the, you know, the fiduciary responsibility. Like we have to, I mean, that, that account was up to, that's almost a teacher that how much that account was up to at one point. So, I mean, we have to, this recommendation, all it does is say, keep giving them lunch and then we will, we'll, we'll keep trying to contact them and call them and get them to pay without, and even if you go the, the Massachusetts law reform also wants to take it a step further saying like we can't, like the, the student, so the student could be um, in negative balance $2,000 and still go like on a field trip or still play an extracurricular sport. Like they don't, like at some point we have to have some mechanism of enforcement if these accounts get too big. I don't want to see this account go back up to $25,000. Like I, this policy is a big reason why that number has, has come down. I don't think it is. Yeah, I, I disagree. I think you're overestimating the importance of policy and underestimating the importance of procedure that has to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, we'll just that's where we agree to disagree. I okay. totally don't. I think I so, think it's to to think that we put a policy in that stopped people from charging when they have a negative balance, and then just by coincidence that balance came down fifteen thousand dollars. And you're going to tell me that? And again, that because we started work. exercising due diligence and collecting it. Yeah, but to get like so, neither of us really know which one had worked more. But the bottom line so, is now is that you can't deny a ch the child the meal anymore. You can still give. And, and, well, philosophically, we shouldn't have been to begin with, and I, and I don't believe that we were ever denying right. food. Right. But but you can still you can provide an alternative lunch. That's that's an option. I mean, it doesn't have to be. Every, and the horror stories and all these. And all these reports are like, you know, the old, the moldy cheese sandwich. Like it, it doesn't have to. That's what they use in all these every it's still, every story it's still that's written have the that way. It's of like a child sitting there with a different lunch. Right. Through whether through, it's a peanut butter through, sandwich through something or, that be, may be absolutely no fault of their own. Yeah, well, we we charge for lunch. Like it's a it's a charged service. Like exactly. So right. I don't understand what the, I don't. What the problem is like? Why why can, I don't understand why. So if if somebody if doesn't pay if somebody doesn't pay for lunch, like we still want to give them lunch. Yes. Even if they're not, it's not like they're they can't afford the lunch. So we need, not in, we need to take care of the student. When the student comes here, we need to give them a meal, because we're in a job of looking out for kids. So we're not going to punish a kid. We're not going to punish a kid because something their parents didn't do. How is an alternative now, lunch punishing now, a kid? Now, if if there's a pattern. There are avenues that we can take to try to collect that money and to try to re resolve the situation. It's th such things as filing a 51A about neglect of a child. And these are types of things that doesn't seem like were explored previously. And they're going to be a lot more, it's a lot easier to implement some of these things that have a lot more teeth than anything you had in that previous policy. If a kid likes a cheese sandwich, what good does an alternate meal do? He's going to get his cheese sandwich for free every day. They'll still cost money. Yeah, but it'll be and, significantly less. And that's if, the point. And if the, the point of an alternative lunch. to a cheese sandwich, then they get nothing. It doesn't have to be like it doesn't. All I'm well, saying is that we have to have. We should. The food services should have the freedom to have a cheaper option for lunch for for families that are not contributing to the lunch program. If they're if they're behind hundreds of dollars. I don't see why. If someone's we're behind hundreds of dollars at this point, we would be taking legal action. That's the part I think you're missing. Is that uh, yeah. I don't think things were being handled appropriately, and I don't know how else I can say that. But, but there's, no even, for, there's no excuse for there's no excuse for a lunch bill being twenty five thousand so dollars. So let's do this. We're pursuing like legal action. Like I'm saying, so let's solve do this. it. Right. We've, it's not. It, if anyone wants a final word on it, we can have that, and then we can just vote and see where we're at with it. Okay. 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 One thing I'd like to say is. I agree with, I don't know if it was Tina or Steve that said that there's probably parts in the old one that, that need to come out, mm -hmm. but I don't think the drastic change to this other one is the way to go. That's just my two cents. Okay. So, so kind uh, of what you're saying, you you put something in there with the, with the and I don't, you know, with the money, whether it's a, a cap, you know, hey, they, you know, what's it, $3 a day, so mm -hmm. if they get to, you know, it's 30 bucks, so that's two weeks, then, then maybe then you do something there, but... Yeah, I don't think just open it up. And again, we could guess and on how that money you sure. know, get whittled down, but we, nobody really knows. And, and I'm not saying you know what happened, but whatever happened, it was working. 
Well, it, I'll give you an example because the preschool and the daycare were in the same position because nobody was nobody was communicating with the parents and nobody was going after the money. So the preschool and the daycare programs now, we don't have a lot of people that aren't paying because we make sure that you know the communication is there. So it wasn't just the food service that was having that problem. It was it was daycare, it was preschool. It was the lunch program. So once the communication started to improve, and then I think the word got out that the communication is here and we're going to collect this money. I think that's what you need to get out to the people is we're not going to allow it to happen anymore. We're going to go after that money that you owe. And I think that's what improved the collection because the preschool and daycare is working fine right now. Well, so I thought part of it, I thought, doesn't the high school, they don't... I thought the high school doesn't charge for lunch, or they're not allowed to charge. That's what, at least, what was told to me when we were doing this last year. Is that that yeah, true? They don't charge. That's so that was the, like, that was part of the argument for that policy was like, well, when they get to the high school, that's what they're going to have to deal with anyway. So let's have it one standard across the board. And we picked, we picked sixth, seventh, and eighth because that was the grade levels where most of the, 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 the you know, the negative balances were found. Could I, what do you mean you don't charge? Do they just have to pay by the day? They, they have. They just pay. They they never really charge. Okay. So <laughs> you, they, you know, and they don't have it. Right. No, I get that. No, you just pay by the day. So yeah. That, okay. Yeah. So the. No, your son will take care of it. But that's a small number. Yeah. Pardon? Nothing <laughs> update. I answer to my wife. The high school is usually easy, even if you have a charging policy, because kids want to graduate. Right. And you just say you can't. It's easy. You can't you're participate until you're. You're not going to walk until your debts are. And so that's why the whole thing. The only problem it should ever present is a kid who doesn't finish his career, because I don't care if you run up three thousand dollars when you're in sixth grade. If you want to graduate, it's three thousand dollars for you to walk on the stage. So the the problem is if people leave, if students choose to attend another school and they skip out on a balance, which I believe is why there was the, the reference to academic records included in the previous policy, mm -hmm. which is a specific one that we cannot enforce. Yeah, I'm, I, and I, like I said from the beginning, I'm fine with, I would just rather take the existing policy and update it versus just ripping it out and replacing it with the, the MSCA proposal. That's all. I, I want, well, so, and again, I want to be clear. It's the MASC recommendation as vetted by Mass General Law. So, so it's Mass General Law, Section 71, Chapter 71, Section 72. I mean, I definitely feel comfortable with the source. I think. Do you want to have the final word, Ed, and then we'll take a vote and see where we're at? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, so this, everything we're talking about was debated. It was talked about possibly becoming law. But it never, it never became law. So I just think we're people keep throwing around Massachusetts law, like there's nothing in aside from some of the things that Dr. Meyer pointed out of maybe holding the curriculum, like everything that this Massachusetts law reform report is advocating for, none of it is law yet. So I just think we should be cognizant of that when like we vote on this because. This which, in report, the which report are you referencing? The guidelines of May 2017, I think, right? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the, the reason that this was brought to Massachusetts legis uh, legislature in the first place. I believe it's the, yeah, the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute or, or whatever, whatever group came up with this report. They investigated a bunch of schools. They found the, the examples of, of food shaming and uh, that there were no policies in a lot of schools. So that's, as far as I can tell, that's how all of this started. And, you know, that's, I, like I said, it's, it's well-intentioned and I, you know, people can have their opinions on it. I just, I don't agree with it. And, and it, you know, I don't think that we're gonna come to agreement on it. So I agree with Joel, it's just, might just, as well just vote. I just have one quick question and, and I'm kind of so just to get- the final, final word. Yeah, <laughs> well, until I get some clarification. So, and I, we're just ballparking the number. You say it's about eight grand that's owed now. So that's just- I, I'm not Exactly sure. Right, but it, whatever it's owed, well, I don't know, it is just be from the middle school, or is that elementary too? Because I didn't realize the high school does. So it's basically, the elementary and the middle school is what's. There might be a little bit at the high school, but there's usually not that much at the high now, school. Now, at the end of the year, then when, when you close the books on the fiscal year, do you, does that start at zero again? Do you have to pay that off? You have to, if, if the. In other words, that eight thousand is that just from this year? Or is that from? 
We only pay off what if the lunch program is in a negative. Okay. Then we have to pay the negative, but not not the full amount. Okay. I, I see. What you're okay. Right. Okay. Just and also just when you asked about the high school, don't forget we have a whole different system. We have an a la carte, and kids are buying things apart from the school lunch. Okay. So don't forget that part. That's so a Kid comes with in need is a school lunch. Okay. Um, but this is like they want an extra. You know, a pizza or something like that. Oh, a cheeseburger. That's the whole thing. Okay, I get it. Thank you. So the base, the lunch is there. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. They're being. Sorry. Well, I was just gonna say if that the, that money that if it doesn't get, like if we have to eat that, I mean that's basically we're shifting the cost of those negative balances. I mean that it just gets shifted ultimately to the taxpayer or to the people that the way some districts get around this is they start charging more for their lunch to try to make up the difference in the cost for the accounts that are in the, that are in the negative. So yeah. that's, it, I would just rather have, I would rather, I'm in favor of a policy that deals with it more proactively so we don't get to a point where we are bill collectors. That's right. all. Right. Okay. Well, I, I will say to that point that we've, in the span of the several years that we've been doing this, have dropped the amount that was owed to the school district by 75 percent so uh, you know and i would argue it's be exactly because of that policy <laughs> right, we're done we're done uh all those in favor of uh adopting efd as a second reading and adoption and then since we all and all those opposed okay and since we are only two uh, so what are we doing with the two. existing policy right now well, I think when we had our first reading and adopted it as a first reading on October 29th, I, what we have to do is work from this first policy to, um, because we supplemented, we supplanted the previous policy with the first reading of this policy. How could we supplant an existing policy we with another policy that's first not reading. even approved? But we adopted it as a first reading. Well, and that's the only, that's hold a on a second. Reading. The only issue was Mr. Bailey's question about the um, school committee being responsible <laughs> for, for the collection. Right. I had issue with it at the time. I brought up a, a, a lot of the but same. It, I just have more detail in but it, my. But it was passed as a first reading. Yeah, I passed it. I was the one that like made the motion to pass it as a first reading. So I mean, that thought, what's the point of? I thought that's the whole reason you have first readings and second readings. I mean, if that's the case, why didn't we just adopt it that night? Because like, it was the. It, it was. I'm saying, what's the what's the point of having first readings and second readings if not and, and for I'm people to have time to investigate? It. The new policy was presented. We adopted it as a first reading. Some concerns were raised, were addressed, were brought back here for a second reading. We had a discussion about that second reading. And, and it appears that we are not uh, ready to adopt it as a policy. Right. But, uh, you know, I, but so we can do one of two things and send this back to the policy subcommittee to uh, you know, with a directive of where we want to go. You know, granted, we are a four-member board here at the moment. Yeah, if, if you want to wait until the I don't next think meeting, we have, have any choice. Here. I don't think we have any choice. Yeah. All right. So we do not we do not have a second reading for this policy. So I will direct the policy subcommittee to go back and uh, and see what we can do to. Uh, amend the current first reading of the policy to be consistent with something that we can pass. Right, well, right now you don't have a policy at all because you've eliminated it. You voted five to zero to eliminate policy, policy EFC dash one. So uh, correct. Then I'll apologize. For that. I have no, I didn't know that that meant just because we adopt something for our first reading that that means that it automatically eliminates the existing it policy. It was part of it. It was a separate motion. Because they can't have both. I mean, we knew we can't have the, we couldn't have the existing policy anymore the way it was written. Okay, like it needed to be changed no matter what. All right, all right, all right. All right so all right, between right. the, I think, 
But regardless, we do have consistent procedures that are in place right now. Yeah. Students are going to get their lunch. Students are going to, uh, so you know, the, the school lunch team is going to be preparing lunches. So I think between the two, <coughs> the one that we did away with and the one that's kind of in limbo, I think there's, between the two of them, there's there's a policy to be had. You know, I think it's just like you say, taking some of the wording out of the first one and, and putting some in here, but just giving it, you know, the teeth to enforce it and, and keep it and going again, without, I, without being too restrictive. Like, I think probably one of the first things I'll do is I'll refer this, we'll refer this either to the MASC attorney or the MASS attorney, because I think at this point right now, for us not to adopt an MASC model policy is something that I've never encountered. Um, and I think that we need to make sure we're checking the legality of this before we go down a road that's not really legal anymore. And that's why there were these advisories that were sent to us, multiple legal advisories. And, and I also just want to be clear with, with everyone here. It's, there are policies and then there are procedures. And I, I think it's bad practice for us to veer into procedures. That's, so. I, I, I understand that, Joel. It's such a gray. I just feel like that argument gets used a lot when the policy is just something that somebody doesn't agree with. A lot of times they'll just say, well, no, that's, you, that's you're drifting into procedure. That's not policy. That, to me, that's a, that's kind of a gray, like, I, I, I don't see what the difference is a lot of times between, like, what we had, what we had existing, the EFC-1, like, I don't see why that is a, you know, not an acceptable policy, why it's being called a procedure. All right. So noted. So uh, if you can get an advisory from yeah, we'll an advisory. that, the policy subcommittee needs to meet and uh, take those uh, issues into consideration. Anything under old business? I just got one thing, and, and right. um, I probably have the numbers wrong, but Steve, can you, um, I know with, with that air conditioning repair bill for the middle school was like 22 or 28,000. And after I left here that night, is it, is it something, can you just find out from us, is it something that, that you know, was a, was a one time thing, in other words, something broke? I know we, we talked about it briefly and I didn't want to, you know, he wasn't here, so I didn't, you know, nobody could really answer. But is it, is it, you know, like, it was with some preventive maintenance that we didn't, we weren't aware that had to happen, you know, just what, what caused it, or is it something like, you know, like you do the uh, sprinkler system in your house and they got to do it every couple of years and it's something we're going to get saddled with. You know, I don't know. No. You just find yeah. out. You know. My understanding is that they used the wrong type of um, uh, thread sealer or something like that on there, and that was causing the debris to get into the lines, so and it was causing the lines thing. to like clear off. So, like the the lines that they've replaced mm -hmm. and fixed should be fixed. Right, right. Um, but the I don't know that they did all of them. And because you, you've heard him, in fact, I know Russ said it here a couple of times where he he says that the system that was put in is the wrong type. Mm -hmm. I, could he? I mean, is it what I'm getting? But is it wrong, or is it just you know, there was a better system out there, and, and right. you know, like like I said, is you know something that it can't sustain. Right. I don't know yeah. if it's not. Yeah, just to some clarification that it, it, I don't think it's like my my take on that, and I and get clarification yeah. from. I don't think it's necessarily like wrong, like right. you would, like someone made a That's huge mistake understand. by putting right. it in, but I think it's probably wasn't optimal at the time or the, or the ideal design. That's quite a hope. Because I just hope that's yeah. yeah, just yeah. kind of clarification would be cool. Thank you. Anything under new business? Yes, once again, I have two things. Oh, five, please. No, and I just, um, so uh, the, the middle school did the uh, uh, veterans in a classroom. Yes. And uh, I know it was Laura Taylor. I know she has other staff members that help her. And I, I, sorry, I don't have all their names, but that was, uh, I was one of the guys that came up and, and I get to go to my son's class and had a lot of laughs. and. Uh, uh, it was a really good time. We really enjoyed it. And then, was it uh, three or four days later, the elementary school had a breakfast for the veterans. And uh, Mrs. Schermack, is that mm -hmm. okay? yeah. yeah, yeah, she put that together. I know Rod was down there and, and Megan as well. And they also, when I went down there that morning, they had the breakfast and they had the, the uh, kindergarten kids sing for a little bit. They put together uh, five boxes of, of um, uh, food. Uh, for the for some of the veterans in town. So when I got back, I went up to the senior center and uh, Debbie Goodsell had a couple of veterans up there. We brought them up that morning and I had a couple that we identified. So that those boxes went out right after Veterans Day and they had the stuff in there kind of, you know, a little bit toward their Thanksgiving, but also just regular stuff. So I just want to appreciate that. If you just let the middle school and the, uh, the elementary school know, we really had a great time. And I will send you, Steve, and the other members of the school committee, the. Um, the Marine Corps does a Toys for Tots thing. We do an event mm -hmm. here in Clinton. This will be our fifth year. But I have a phone number I can get you guys. If anyone wants it, if you have families that 
may need it. So they don't go, like we collect it, we have no, like I just drop them off, but there's a phone number you can call and then the family calls direct and it's very private. So if you have, you know, some of the, the, the families that, you know, that need the help, I can get you the phone number, I'll get you the, the but anyway, thank you. Terrific, thank you. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion. So moved.